everybody. I think we can get started. Certainly feel free to shuffle around, grab some food if you haven't. But let's get us started. So I'm Kathy Adella. I am a physics professor at Mount Holyoke College. I am the host for the evening, although you won't hear too much from me other than the uh, acknowledgments and some, some announcements. Um, we're here to uh, hear uh, Scott Garman uh, talk, tell us about curing the common cold and seeing things that we have no business seeing in some ways, certainly with the naked eye. Um, we, uh, so let me get a sense first of how many of you have never been here before? That's fantastic. An extra special welcome to you, but an extra special welcome to our regulars for coming back time after time. Um, SciTech Cafe is a science cafe, and the idea behind the science cafes are that we bring a scientist, that would be Scott today, into an informal setting, that would be Amherst Brewing Company, to talk about science with the general public. So you do not need a science background. And one of the special things about this event compared to um, going and watching documentaries in museums is that you can actually ask questions and interact and get answers to those questions that you have been always wondering about. So we encourage questions, ask questions, ask lots of questions. If you've asked three questions already, maybe go and see if your neighbor wants to ask your next question so that we don't get too many questions from exactly the same people. But this should be an interactive process. Um, and there are demonstrations today and um, we ha well, Scott has been here many times. He's a regular with his family so he knows what people are expecting and uh, what, what he wants to do. Um, so what, how does the Science Cafe, SciTech Cafe come here? Well, we have funding largely from the National Science Foundation um, through the Materials Research Center on Polymers at the University of Massachusetts, through the, Nas through the Center for Hierarchical Manufacturing and Nano Center at the University of Massachusetts, um, as well as from community-based learning at Mount Holyoke, which is bringing uh, academic learning, classroom learning into, um, into the community. We have our last event of the year. We take a break for July and August, but it is going to be on Monday, June 9th. This is breaking the regular pattern. So Monday, June 9th, because we're trying to avoid Memorial Day. And this is going to be UMass physicists fold under pressure. And they're gonna talk about origami. And they're doing some really fascinating things with origami, understanding both the theory behind origami and using it um, in the types of materials that are actually biocompatible and what is it that we can actually do with these materials. So that's going to be uh, Thomas Hull, Chris Santangelo, and Ryan Hayward, who will be here in about a month. Two other events next week. There is another science cafe in this area, the Organismic and Evolutionary Biology Cafe. Their next event is Sex and Drugs and Planets and Bugs. That's going to be Monday, May 5th, um, and at, the ca at Esalon Cafe, if you want to go attend there. And then I am actually doing a science on screen at Amherst Cinema next Tuesday. And that is uh, the movie Fantastic Voyage from 1966, which is a story about uh, miniaturizing a crew and a submarine to go into the body to then use a laser, which were relatively new, um, to cut out a blood clot. And then the adventures that follow. It won awards in 1966. Um, it's delightfully dated um, now in a way that when I rewatched it, right, it's not early CGI, it's not early computer effects. It's like they built things out of uh, felt and cardboard, not cardboard, um, but they actually had to like create this, this inner world. And the introduction in the first 20 minutes is going to be about, well, what can nanotechnology do today that actually um, targets medical interventions inside the body? Can we send mini robots in the body to do things? So that is what I have. And with that, I will pass it off to Scott Garman. OK, so um, today we're going to talk about um, a spectrum of things from a spectrum of sizes and a different uh, uh, spaces we will talk about. So um, everybody should have received a few pipe cleaners if my kids have done their jobs correctly. I want you to make a nice long linear polymer of your pipe cleaner. So while I'm talking, feel free to weave yourself a nice long, uh, a, it turns out our pipe cleaners are going to re represent a polypeptide and um, a longer polypeptide folds up into more interesting shapes than the default 12-inch pipe cleaners. It turns out it's very hard to find three-meter pipe cleaners. <clears throat> so let's get a sense of the scale we're going to talk about today. Le Leonardo da Vinci uh, drew this famous picture uh, of Vitruvian man. And a man is on the order of, uh, this man is on the order of two meters. Okay, so two meters is 
is about this big. And what we're going to do today is get down um, to what we call uh, nanometer scales. So we have to um, increase our magnification by, say, 10 orders of magnitude. So the first thing we're going to do is take a little trip uh, in orders of magnitude. So if we look in the middle of our man and zoom in on that, our man has lungs. Lungs are on the order of uh, 0.2 meters, something like that. We are going to zoom in to the bronchi. Bronchi in diameter are a couple of centimeters. OK, that's two orders of magnitude we, we've gone down. So now we're going to go down into the bronchi, into the tissues in the lungs, and we get to the alveoli. Alveoli are on the order of a couple of millimeters, something like that. Little air sacs in the lungs. And now we've done three orders of magnitude. OK, zooming in on those air sacs in the lungs, we get Here are the air sacs in the lungs. Air sacs in the lungs. We can start to see cells when we've done four orders of magnitude. We're at uh, 200 microns, or 0.2 millimeters, of magnification here. And um, we're starting to see cells. So let's zoom in on those cells. And when we're at 20 microns of magnification, the fifth order of magnitude, we start to see individual cells. OK, those individual cells have features and so forth. We're halfway there. So here is what looks like a sphere. But no, in fact, it's a cell. We need to look inside the cell when we're interested in um, what's going on inside a cell. So what we're trying to do is use um, the techniques of physics that we've borrowed to look at a biological problem like what's going on in a cell. Those are not true colors. So um, we are actually at a resolution where um, color is no longer. At some point, once you get past the, say, um, 700 nanometers of, of visible light, uh, colors actually drop off. So this is actually a false color image. It's actually from an electron micrograph. But this artist, uh, Ann Weston, has colored it in a very beautiful way. OK, let's zoom in a little bit more. If we look inside a cell, we get, um, so here's our, a piece of our cell right here. And these, um, these dark little guys with the Vs, these are viruses. These are influenza viruses that are binding on the surface of a lung epithelial cell. And um, we're now at our sixth layer, uh, our sixth order of magnitude in uh, magnification. And um, we're going to take a look at those viruses. At 200 nanometers, or 0.2 microns of magnification, we start to see individual viruses. It turns out those viruses have um, a bunch of nucleic acid material on the inside and a bunch of proteins on the outside. And these um, spiky proteins are doing the job of the virus to help get into the lung epithelial cell. One more expansion. We're going to look at the, uh, a, a cross section of our virus. So now here's our nucleic acid. And again, um, this is not an electron micrograph. This is an artist's depiction. But inside the flu virus, we have nucleic acid material that propagates the genetic information of the virus. And on the surface, we have these spiky proteins. The blue one is called the hemagglutinin. The red one is called the neuraminidase. They have crazy names, but it turns out they um, do functions on the surface of the cell. The hemagglutinin, its job is to bind the lung epithelial cells and um, get the virus particle inside the lung epithelial cell. The neuraminidase's job is to act as an enzyme to cut off some of those receptors on the surface of the lung. OK, let's look at the neuraminidase. And we're going to zoom in 
So now we're down to two nanometers of, res of, of magnification and we're looking at an individual protein. Um, it turns out the, the nerminidase from the flu virus is a tetramer. There's four symmetric objects arranged in a regular fourfold symmetric, symmetric pattern. And again, the job of this protein is it acts as an enzyme. It cleaves off receptors that are on the surface of the lung epithelial cell. And that prevents a flu virus from reinfecting the same cell that it just came out of. One more level of magnification. We zoom in one last time. And now we're at the level of atoms. And at the level of atoms, we can do chemistry. So here is, um, this is called the binding site, or the active site of flu nerminidase. And it's got all these features in it. So these are now the um, electron class, the, the surface of the flu virus that's determined by the electrons that are associated with the atoms on this protein. So uh, this uh, compound that has the sticks, are, those are um, exploratory compounds that are being soaked into this enzyme in order to um, treat the flu. So th this is um, um, experiments where the um, investigator is testing compounds to inhibit the flu virus from uh, infecting and propagating in lung epithelial cells. OK, so I think that was 10 orders of magnitude of resolution. So what we've done here is, is now we're at the level of individual bond distances. So a carbon-carbon bond is, say, 0.15 nanometers. And what we're going to do today is take that distance, and we're going to um, expand it from here out to um, Grace's and Caroline's cousin's house in California. We're going to take um, a two centimeter distance, stretch it across, across the country to California. That's the level of magnification we're going to be talking about today. OK? How are we going to do that? How are we going to get that level of magnification? Well, we're going to go visit Bizarro World. OK? Who knows anything about Bizarro World? Any uh, fans of Superman comics from the 1960s? What's Bizarro World? An alternate universe. OK, in Bizarro World, the Earth is not um, spherical. It's a cube. In Bizarro World, there's Superman, but there's also this character called Bizarro Superman. And Bizarro Superman, you can see the S on, uh, S on Superman is, is frontwards. The S on Bizarro Superman is backwards. Um, and uh, if Superman is good, Bizarro Superman is not good or evil. In Bizarro World, there's a Bizarro Code where we do the opposite of what happens on Earth. So we spend most of our time in uh, non-Bizarro space, but today we're going to visit Bizarro space. What else happens in Bizarro World? It turns out um, Batman, this is Batman. Um, this is, um, uh, what is his name? His name is Batzaro, I think. So he is the alter ego of Batman who lives in Bizarro World. And you can see his bat is upside down. He's got some bad teeth. And it turns out his utility belt has um, chewed up gum and gum wrappers and trash in it. I, I learned quite a bit about Bizarro World. Seinfeld visited Bizarro World. I don't know if anybody remembers the classic Seinfeld episode. But here is real world Jerry and George and Kramer. And here are the Bizarro World equivalents of them. And uh, uh, these characters are nice characters because they live in the opposite universe of the Seinfeld characters. <laughs> So here's some things that I put together, the difference between real world and bizarro world. So that cubic looking Earth is actually Earth spelled backwards. Um, what is small in the real world is big in bizarro world and vice versa. Things that are right side up in this world are upside down in bizarro world. There are these characters in the real world who have their alter egos in bizarro world. And then, um, we have something in this world, the time domain. In Bizarro world, we're going to think about the frequency domain. 
And specifically for, for crystallography, um, we live in real space, but um, we call it reciprocal space, right? Reciprocal is upside down. OK, so we're ready for our first experiment into Bizarro World. I need a volunteer who wants to visit Bizarro World. You won't get hurt. Um, there should be no lasting impact, but I haven't tested this experiment fully. <laughs> Gracie, would you like to be the, this is my daughter Grace. She has signed the release. Okay, I would like you to stand here. You're the visitor to Bizarro World. I need somebody who is a good detective. Do we have any people that are good detectives who aren't going to drop this very expensive lens that I borrowed from Mount Holyoke College? Do we have any very responsible volunteers? Come on up. All right, Gracie, I'm going to light you up on your head here because we need light to visit Bizarro World. No, not too close, please. Don't look at it. Elsa, can you hold this with two hands and not let go? All right, here's my investigator into Bizarro World. I need one more person who's our detector in Bizarro World. Want to be our, our detector? Yeah, come on over. So Elsa, watch out for these cords here. But I need you to get relatively close to Grace. And I need you to hold that up. And right like that. And I need you to hold this paper out here and see if we can see an image of Grace. That is quite a lens. That's quite a lens. Hold it there. Oh, there it is. Hold it still. OK, we got the lens. And in Bizarro World, it's over here. OK, so I need you to hold this and take that paper over and see. Wait, wait. So look at, look at the paper. Sarah, maybe you can help. We're trying to image the light. That's it. There it is. OK, so what do you see over there? Maybe back it up a little bit. And is it right side up or upside down? Upside down. Yeah, it's upside down. So when we visit from real space, we, OK, so I think that would work for our demo. Let's take a break and let's explain what happened. Let's thank our volunteers. <clears throat> OK, so when you shine some light and an object in real space, that light bounces off the object in real space and enters bizarro world, or as scientists like to call it, reciprocal space. So we have this space that is the opposite of real space that then we can use a tool like a magnifying lens to capture that scattered information. It captures the light that's scattered that's off, right? So the, the light that's scattered off of grace is invisible. We capture that light with our um, convex lens. And over here, we make an image of what we scattered. Right? So um, this lens is a tool that takes us from reciprocal space, that scattered light that's invisible, and it makes an image back in real space that we can see. Okay? And again, as a souvenir of our trip to Bizarro World, the image gets inverted. Okay. There's also a way of going to Bizarro World. Here's a photograph of people in my lab from last summer. And of course, at Six Flags, there's a Bizarro Superman with the backwards S. And here are some scientists in my lab who are doing experiments about visiting um, reciprocal space or Bizarro World. So we do research every day in our lab, just like this. <laughs> so we can actually. Um, make a schematic diagram of this experiment we just did. So here we have some light. We shine a light on an object. That light comes off the object. And our lens is our bridge between real space and reciprocal space, or real world and bizarre world, if you will. OK? And then we get this upside down image. So we're going to use these principles from physics to image stuff, 
except the object we're looking at is not the size of a human. It's going to be this um, 10 orders of magnitude smaller object that we, um, it turns out we're going to use these same principles. Okay? So, let's bring out some other tools. So, I have a diffraction grating. So, this is um, a piece of plastic with, this says 500 lines per millimeter on it. So, these lines are too small to see, but um, what we can do is use lasers to interrogate what's going on. So, here's an object in real world that's too small to see, and we're going to use physics principles, just like what we saw, to basically tell us what's going on at, uh, to see what is normally invisible. Okay? So, if this is 500 lines per millimeter, what do we expect to see when we shine a laser through this? What is it? Light. We're going to see light. So here's our laser. Can we see the green spot in our little cove up there? So now I'm going to put my um, diffraction grating in front of it. What do we see? More green spots. Okay, that's called diffraction. If you shine a laser through a diffraction grating, you get diffraction. And the, the location of those spots tells us about the spacing of the lines. Okay? So 500 lines per millimeter. And now I'm swapping that out for another diffraction grating that says it has 1,000 lines per millimeter. What do we expect to see if this diffraction is in bizarro world? It's either half or twice. Let's uh, take a little ballot. Who thinks it's going to be um, uh, wider space spots in our experiment? Who thinks it's going to be narrower space spots in our experiment? OK, so if we have 500 lines per millimeter versus 1,000 lines per millimeter, which is the smaller object? Right? A thousand lines per millimeter is a smaller object in real space. What, what happens if we go into bizarro space or reciprocal space? Larger spacing. Okay, there's a thousand lines per millimeter. Here's 500, and here's a thousand. 500 and a thousand. So we get um, an a reciprocal relationship. The smaller the object in real space, the wider the spacing in uh, reciprocal space or bizarro world. Okay? What happens if I take um, two of these diffraction gratings and turn them 90? So, so now I have one set of lines that's going this way, another set of lines that's going this way. What's going to happen <clears throat> when I shine my laser through? We're not going to get, we're not going to, we're going to now get um, an array of spots, right? So we have diffraction in the up and down direction. We have diffraction in the left to right direction. And I have a couple different diffraction gratings with different spacings. Okay, so we can interrogate shapes in two and three dimensions using tools like diffraction. OK, what happens if I have a couple of diffraction gratings that are um, offset from one another? So I take our, we have a two-dimensional diffraction grating, and then I put another two-dimensional diffraction grating. And if my laser holds up, I get I get lots of spots. And if I rotate one relative to the other, I get all kinds of star patterns. Sorry for those of you that are on the wings, but I can't figure out anywhere else to do this. Is that better? Okay, that's two aligned diffraction gratings, and then if we offset them, we get all kinds of dancing stars. Okay, 
So we can use, question, yeah. That is a fantastic question. The question is, what happens if you change the color of the laser? As it turns out, I collect lasers. Here's a uh, green laser. So uh, let's see if I can hold two lasers and a diffraction grating in one hand. Here's our green laser. Here's a purple laser. And do I have the dexterity to pull this off? Okay, the location of the spots depends on the wavelength of the light. I also have a red laser, but I don't have the um, hands to pull that off. Okay, so there's a, there's, a, um, there's a relationship called Bragg's Law that tells us about, um, um, there's a very um, clear mathematical relationship between the wavelength of the radiation and, and the size of the, the spots in real space, the size of the lines in real space, and the location of the spots in diffraction space. Okay. So now let's take a look at what we've done so far. We did our light diffraction experiment. We sh shown light at an object like Grace. We captured that scattered light with our lens, and then we made an image by collecting that scattered information. So now if we want to probe objects that are um, at smaller size than the wavelength of light, we're going to use that same principle, but some of the um, pieces of hardware change. Instead of light, we're going to use x-rays. So there are ways of making x-rays. You can basically use a filament in a light bulb and um, basically crash it into a piece of metal, and you get x-rays. So now we're going to shine x-rays at an object. So now um, we're not going to shine x-rays at an object that's the size of a human. We're going to shine x-rays at an object that's the size of a protein. Okay? So we're 10 to the 10 orders of magnitude uh, smaller than a human. And what we get is an x-ray diffraction photograph. Okay? We just saw laser diffraction with um, 1,000 lines per millimeter. We need to go five orders of magnitude smaller than that. So we're not going to use visible light. We're going to use x-rays, but the principles are the same. We're going to look at those spots the same way we saw those spots as generated by the lasers. OK? So now it turns out x-rays don't bend very nicely um, like um, question from my spouse. What's the difference between light and x-rays? And why would you use x-rays instead of? Right. So um, when we went, so the question is, why are we using x-rays and not light? So it turns out the, um, the object you're interrogating, the information you want from the object you're interrogating um, is related, the information you can get out of it depends on the wavelength of the light you shine at it. So if you're shining visible light at an object, the, the most you can see is like 400 to 700 nanometers. It's sort of on the order of the wavelength of visible light, which is 400 to 700 nanometers. That's not good enough if you want to see atomic distances, if you want to see proteins, if you want to see stuff that is still um, three or four orders of magnitude smaller than that. So we're going to use um, electromagnetic radiation, but it's not going to be visible light. It's going to be x-rays. So x-rays. Again, I mentioned um, a carbon-carbon bond is about 0.15 nanometers in distance. The x-rays we use in our lab are about that same size, within a factor of two or something like that. So we're, again, using the wavelength of radiation that interrogates the information we're trying to get. And in this case, we want to know where atoms are, and visible light doesn't have enough uh, high frequency to do that. OK? So now we're going to use some mathematics. And this mathematics um, is, you know, physicists have worked out these principles for hundreds of years. And the mathematics are complicated. They're called Fourier transforms. But they're straightforward. It's the Fourier transform, or the lens, is how we get from diffraction space, or bizarro world, back into real world. And so those mathematics we understand 
due to the hard work of physicists over the centuries. And when we do that, we take our diffraction pattern, we do our transformation between bizarro world back to real world, we get an image that comes out the other side, and here's an image of a protein. So again, we're at 10 to the 9 orders of, of magnitude there in, in amplification, but we can actually also look at atomic, atomic, uh, atomic distances, carbon, carbon bonds. If we want to do chemistry, we can shine x-rays at proteins, and that tells us where the atoms are. And if we know where the atoms are, we know how to do interesting chemistry. OK? So we're using um, the tools of physics to answer questions in biology and solve them in chemistry. So those of you in school often treat biology as different from physics, which is different from chemistry. But when you get to real world, it turns out um, all of that stuff mixes together uh, in this bizarre world uh, that we visit with diffraction. Okay, and we are, of course, um, standing on the shoulders of giants. This is an x-ray diffraction of a protein crystal. This is an x-ray diffraction image uh, of DNA. Oh, and I got chopped off a little bit at the bottom. Uh, but Rosalind Franklin took this x-ray photograph, and she was the most gifted um, experimentalist in, in her field in her day. And um, this is basically um, an experiment that brought lots of people from the world of physics over into the world of biology. Okay? And in bizarre world, right, so what do we know about the structure of DNA? We know Rosalind Franklin pulled out a fiber of DNA, shot x-rays at it, and got this pattern. What do we know about the structure of DNA? Does that look like the structure of DNA? <coughs> so this is the bizarro world representation of DNA. So in the bizarro world representation of DNA, um, a long distance here is a short distance in our world. So DNA has bases. The bases stack together on top of one another. And that spacing is 0.34 nanometers. Every base in the three, 3 billion base pairs of your DNA stacks on top of one another. That spacing is repeated over and over and over again. And that small spacing, the stacking of DNA bases, is represented by this big smeary stuff here. That's, the, that's in reciprocal space. That's 1 over 0.34 nanometers. We can measure that distance. And again, Bragg's law says we can get from reciprocal space or bizarro world back into the real world. OK? So big is small, and small is big. So um, this long spacing here tells us about close spacing in the structure of DNA. OK? In bizarro world, a cross is a helix in the real world. So Francis Crick looked at this image, saw the X, the X to somebody that studied helical diffraction like Francis Crick did. The X immediately means there's a helix in there. And that was one of the insights that allowed Watson and Crick to um, make a model for the structure of DNA based upon these and other evidence. OK? And it turns out I don't have this demo going. I didn't get it. I got too distracted when I was getting going. But um, I will just explain it. So, so when we go from diffraction space and go back into real space, it turns out those x-rays that we shot at our protein, they interact with the electrons. So the result of an x-ray diffraction experiment is the location of the electrons in the protein. What is the shape of a helix? We're just about there. We're almost to the point where we're done with the physics and we're headed into the biology. But we're, we're getting there, we're getting there, we're getting there. OK, so now we need to know some biology and some chemistry before we can answer the questions we're trying to answer, like um, can we cure the common cold? So proteins are made of amino acids. And amino acids have their own personalities. Some of them are very social. They want to um, meet their opposite type. So we have um, negatively charged amino acids who like to interact with positively charged amino acids the same way um, um, high school boys and girls like to interact. We have grumpy amino acids that basically want to be left alone. 
Okay? They do not want to hang out with other amino acids and um, they more or less want to be left alone. And then we have um, amino acids that like to form gangs. Okay? So each of the 20 amino acids has their own personality and when you make a polypeptide you string together these 20 amino acids in different combinations in a linear way and the personalities of the amino acids determine the folded shape of the protein. Okay? We need to know one more thing about protein. Protein's made as a linear string and then that linear string does stuff based upon the personalities of the characters that are encoded in that particular amino acid, uh, in that particular polypeptide chain. So there are some things called secondary structure where we have these helices. So sometimes the polypeptide likes to spin up into a helix. Sometimes it likes to form these sheets, these corrugated sheets. And then those secondary structure elements come together to make tertiary structure. So there's biology and chemistry that drives it, but basically the personalities of these different amino acids determine how that linear polypeptide folds up. Okay? So now it's time for you guys to do your first model building exercise and grab um, your polypeptide chain. And if we put it um, on our left index finger, and wrap towards us and go towards the end of our index finger, that should make a right-handed helix that we're going to call an alpha helix. Anybody successfully make their first alpha helix? There's an alpha helix over there. It should be right-handed, which means as you spin around uh, you should curl around, it should follow your right hand as you trace it around. Okay, if you made a left-handed alpha helix, that's okay, um, but they're rare in nature and we're trying to be um, extremely accurate with our pipe cleaners here. Okay, the next secondary structure element we want to make is a um, beta strand, and I don't know how I'm going to show this. So a beta strand is like a corrugated piece of cardboard. Every other amino acid, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. So the, um, the backbone goes up and down, and it's called a beta strand or a beta pleated sheet, and it kind of looks like corrugated cardboard. Okay? See if you can make a beta strand by making some corrugations in your polypeptide chain. <clears throat> And so now you've made the primary building blocks of a polypeptide, of a protein structure. So we have our primary chain, that's the linear sequence. It folds up into these secondary structure elements. And then the secondary structure elements pack against one another based upon the personalities of the different amino acids, and that determines the fold. So you start with any arbitrary um, uh, sequence of amino acids and then you fold up into a specific shape and that's determined entirely by the personalities of the amino acids that are encoded in that polypeptide chain. How are we doing? Anybody make, um, this is a very famous, uh, very famous polypeptide fold. Anybody who made that should um, come and sign up in my lab immediately, please. Here's an effort I made. This is a, um, it's an approximation of this. This is called a beta alpha bait barrel. It's a beta, uh, a beta strand and then an alpha helix and then another beta strand and then an alpha helix and then another beta strand and then an alpha helix. So you have eight beta strands in the middle and eight alpha helices around the outside. I think I needed quite a few pipe cleaners to make that. Um, if you need more pipe cleaners, we have more. Okay. So one of the things I want you to notice is when you get a folded polypeptide, different places in that linear sequence end up in the same physical space, right? So it turns out in a fold like this, this loop and 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 this loop, and this loop which are 
widely, widely spaced in the primary sequence end up in close physical proximity. And the personality of the amino acids that are in these loops, they want to do chemistry. They want to break bonds. They want to bind stuff and cut stuff into pieces. Okay? So that's how life works at the chemical levels. Your DNA encodes polypeptides. Polypeptides fold up and do chemistry that the cell needs to get stuff done. Question? Yeah, a, poly, uh, a polypeptide is um, a string of amino acids that then folds up into a protein. So they're the same chemical um, species, but in, in my field, you normally think of a polypeptide is the linear string, and then it folds up into the shape of a protein. So one's folded and the other's not? That's a reasonable way of thinking about it, yeah. Question? No. So um, can an amino acid take on only an, an alpha helix or a beta sheet uh, uh, conformation? No. So um, some of the amino acids, like the notorious proline, really like to be in turns and are almost always found in turns, the periphery between the alpha helix and the beta strand. Um, but basically, um, some of them have preferences. Like, for example, alanine is two-thirds of the time found in an alpha helix, but one-third of the time it's not. But, but a, a length of amino acid can, oh, at, at any given time, can only have one. A length, can a length of amino acid only have one conformation? At one time. At one it time. It change halfway through to another one. Um, so it, it depends on the chemistry. So, um, there are stretches of five and six amino acids that are sometimes formed in alpha helix conformations and sometimes found in beta strand conformations. And there are, there's very interesting biology that happens when an amino acid goes from um, being uh, in not an alpha helix into an alpha helix. And in fact, that's how the flu virus gets into your lung epithelial cells. There are amino acids that go from being in a turn into an alpha helix, and that basically shoves a knife into the cell and allows the, the virus to get into the cell. So there's very interesting biology that underlies that chemistry. OK, and I talked about how um, folding of the molecule makes up a binding site. And we did our little experiment in protein folding. So now we need to think about the flu virus, OK? We saw this. This is our um, flu neuraminidase is the name of this enzyme. And this neuraminidase enzyme has these deep pockets. These pockets are called the active site of the enzyme. That's where this neuraminidase breaks bonds, OK? And it does that in order to allow the flu virus to escape one cell and go and invade, invade a neighboring cell or um, a neighboring uh, child or something. So it's basically how the flu virus propagates its biological life cycle is it gets out of one cell, it gets into a cell, it makes copies of itself, and then it goes on to a different cell. Okay? So this is called a drug target. It's a protein that you can exploit for um, if you inhibit these red patches. If you can stick some chemical in the red patches in the flu neuraminidase, you can break the life cycle of the flu virus. Okay? And this has been done successfully using the techniques that we've talked about today, the, the protein chemistry questions, the x-ray crystallography questions. So this is the receptor on your lung epithelial cell for the flu. I mean, it's, not, its job is not evolved to um, bind the flu virus. But you have these um, small molecules on the surface of your lung epithelial cells. They're called sialic acid ligands. And what happens is the flu neuraminidase binds to this shape. OK? So um, how are we going to cure the flu? 
we are going to make compounds that look kind of like the ligand that the flu virus really likes to bind, except they're going to gum up the mechanism of the nerminidase on the surface of the flu. Okay? And there's a couple compounds, Tamiflu, Relenza, that are basically small molecules, and what they do is they sit in that patch on the surface of the flu nerminidase and gum it up so that the flu can't bind silic acid, so the flu can't do its job that's required for propagation of the virus uh, in its life cycle. Okay? And that ends up being a bunch of um, pharmaceutical chemists and medicinal chemists who are looking at the structure of the flu, the structure of the flu nerminidase, the structure of the receptor for the flu nerminidase, and um, making compounds that are mimics. Okay? And so I mentioned that different amino acids have different propensities to interact. So these histidines, these um, uh, glutamates, they want to interact with their receptor. And so um, chemists at drug companies can exploit those um, interactions to make compounds that break the life cycle of the flu. Question. Do the molecules just randomly bump into the flu virus, or are they somehow directed? Right. So, um, so the sialic acid is on the surface of a cell. So it's not floating around. It's anchored on the surface of the cells that are in your lungs. And it's not going anywhere. But the, the flu virus actually takes the anchored sialic acid and liberates them. So there's, there's some amount of this floating around. But no, when you, um, when you take these compounds, yeah, you have to get them into your lungs. So one of the things that drug companies do is work on um, uh, ways of delivering these compounds to where they need to go. So in the case of the flu virus, in the case of the common cold virus, all the action is in the, the lung epithelial cells. So you're looking at um, inhaled mechanisms for treating them and so forth. But if you're talking about cancer, if you're talking about some other disease, the delivery of the drug ends up being a different, uh, you might use a different avenue for delivering. Question. Yeah. Right. So, so that's, a, that's a terrific question. The question is, do all the different strains of flu have the same two proteins, hemagglutinin and nermidase, which are ridiculous names for proteins? But um, yes. So it turns out that, um, right. Right. So, so we've heard about H1N1 flu, H5N1 flu. So all of those differences in all of the strains of the flu, N in this case is, is nerminidase, H is hemagglutinin, the ridiculous names of the ridiculous proteins, but basically the red stuff does not vary. It is absolutely conserved because that's required for the nerminidase to bind to acylic acid and cleave it, but everything else is subject to change. And that's why you have to get a flu vaccine every year because you might um, have a vaccine that allows you to recognize this particular set of amino acids, but then the flu virus recombines. There are these mechanisms for um, um, evasion of the immune system that the flu viruses have. They're called antigenic drift and antigenic shift. And every 11 years, it turns out there's some recombination event where the flu presents a very different surface, and that tends to be associated with very severe flu seasons. Um, but basically, to answer your question, this part never changes because that stuff is absolutely conserved to do the job that's required for the life cycle of the flu. The rest of the stuff is just a decoy for the immune system, and that's why we have to get vaccines every year. Is there a question back there still? Yes, you have these protein molecules in the, on, on the surface of the lung that they bind to the virus binding you, correct? So it turns out um, the sialic acid, the, what flu virus binds to is not a protein, but a carbohydrate. But it, it, there's a receptor on the surface. But those carbohydrates are there for a reason other than to bind to the flu. Yes. And does this drug that you're putting into a flu, does that gum up or change how those things bind to the flu? Yeah, I mean, that's a terrific question. So the question is, um, if you're ingesting analogs of sialic acid, 
isn't that interfering with the normal function of sialic acid? Um, most of the time, sialic acid is found on the surface of cells, attached to proteins, attra attached to lipids. Most of the time, it's not floating around. And it turns out the, um, it's a terrific question, and that's why you don't take um, Relenza air all the time. You take it um, in order to treat a disease. But sure, anytime you, you take a molecule that looks a lot, you, you ingest a molecule that looks a lot like something that is important for the biology, you're, you're um, um, introducing the possibility of side effects. It's absolutely true. Yeah, the obvious question is why can't you just use sialic acid and just overload it and uh, just clog up viruses before they can even get into cells? Right. It's a natural substance that's in my lungs. Right. right? So the question is why can't you use sialic acid as a drug for um, uh, treating the flu, right? We know that the um, neuraminidase on the flu binds sialic acid, but it turns out these guys are actually better binders. So um, the, the flu has evolved not just to bind to these receptors, but to let go at some point. And so it's actually easier to get tighter binding in these um, sialic acid analogs and tighter binding means you can bind and kill the flu in a way that um, the sialic acid is basically called a low affinity or a weak ligand, and the, um, uh, the drug compounds are tighter binders to those surface proteins. Okay, so we've talked a bit about flu, but of course the common cold, we haven't cured that. So, so drug companies, uh, pharmaceutical companies, have developed treatments for the flu. You can get vaccines, you can get these, um, these sialic acid analogs that work to gum up the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase. So now here's the, um, the rhinovirus, which causes the common cold. So in this case, it's a, it's a very beautiful icosahedral virus. It looks like a soccer ball or whatever. But there's no hemagglutinin, there's no neuraminidase, the receptor is not sialic acid. So um, the same principles are in place. The virus binds to a surface marker, a surface receptor on the lung epithelial cells, gets into the cells, takes over the cells, makes copies of itself, and then goes elsewhere. But we're not as far along with the common cold as we are with the flu. So we have the same principles in place. We can look at this surface and look at the proteins on the surface of the rhinovirus and say, look, oh, there's a nice channel. There's a nice channel, right? So we're, we're following, we're looking for um, cures for the common cold using these principles that we've talked about, but we're not there yet. And that's um, why the question that we're tossing out is, can we cure the common cold using these principles? Okay, I think I'm out of time. I will stop there and take any questions that anybody might have. Question here. Um, I see there like there are star shapes in the blue patches on there. Are yes. they like all identical? Like are they the same or are they like different? Yeah, so the, you must be a soccer player or something. So the question is, are the blue patches all identical? Yeah, so so viruses carry around a, a relatively small genome, and one of the things they have to do is is encapsulate their nucleic acid. And so one efficient way to do it is to use a relatively small number of proteins, but have lots of copies of that protein. And it turns out um, these viruses are called icosahedral viruses. And an icosahedron has a five-fold axis and a three-fold axis and a two-fold axis. And um, so does a soccer ball. And basically, um, nature has found a way of making um, not carrying a, around a lot of genetic information, but using lots of copies of the protein that comes off that genetic information in order to make this package, in order to deliver the nucleic acid to the cells, which allows that virus to propagate. So yeah, um, it's, it's a principle of um, uh, conservation that a small amount of genetic material can lead to um, a nice icosahedral package and protect the nucleic acid. Yes, the, the, col, uh, uh, the common cold is caused by this thing, which is called the human rhinovirus.
and it is a virus. That's right. Do any of the proteins act like a flu virus? So, um, yeah, it's, that's an interesting question. So it turns out um, some vaccines are actually attenuated viruses. So if you have um, a vaccine, it's got protein in it, but no nucleic acid. So the way these viruses work is they have proteins that protect the genetic information. And um, if you have um, just the protein part of a virus, it can work as a vaccine. And so it won't, it won't propagate to other cells, but it will um, certainly interact with the, the, the chemistry on your cells. Yeah, right. Uh, so the question is, it seems like it's hard to get proteins to crystallize in order to get these atomic um, images, and that is absolutely true. And there's some people in my lab who in, were ha would be happy to uh, commiserate about how hard it is to crystallize proteins, but yeah. So um, growing a crystal of a salt is easy, right? But growing a crystal of a protein um, ranges from being um, difficult to impossible, depending on what protein you're talking about. And so what we do is, if you, anybody know how to grow rock candy? Who's, who's grown rock candy? How do you grow rock candy? I remember your parents made it. Your parents made it. Was there heat involved? Yes. Right, you take about this much sugar, you pour it into boiling water, you saturate that um, solution with whatever you're trying to crystallize. And in the case of sugar, you can use heat. And so you basically heat it up, you slowly cool it down, and then you drop a string in there, or you basically nucle nucleate it, and then you um, get crystals. So we're using these same techniques of you make a supersaturated solution, you slowly, um, um, in, if, you, if you make a supersaturated solution of a protein and slowly drive the concentration up, if you're lucky, you can get the protein to crystallize. We don't use heat because heat will actually denature proteins, right? When we cook eggs, when we cook egg whites, if you add heat to proteins, it often makes them go from being folded back into the linear form, and that's not that'll never crystallize. Okay, so I did bring um, <clears throat> I did bring a tray. So this is how we do our protein crystallization experiments, and we're basically working at the um, uh, cubic millimeter scale or less and we're basically slowly saturating a solution with protein, and if we get that right, we can grow crystals. And, um, but it, it fails 99% of the time, at least. It, it is hard. I didn't get the answer. Can we expect to cure the common cold? <laughs> um, yes, I'm an optimist. I would say these techniques will get us to treating the common cold, curing, um, that's a harder, that's a, that's a harder thing. Certainly, we will get better treatments for it. Chicken soup. Chicken soup contains sialic acid, as it turns out. I remember hearing a long time ago that there's like some finite number of versions of the common cold, like 130 or 140. And when you get a cold, from then on, you're immune to that type. So if you could ever live long enough to get 140, is any of that true, or is that all just the, the, You're talking about rhinovirus or, or flu? Yeah, Gosh, I don't know how many versions of rhinovirus there are. So that, um, um, that it, it depends a little bit on, um, does one amino acid change? Is that a different strain, or is that the same strain? It turns out to your immune system, changing one surface amino acid can change the personality of that protein and can make an immunogenic protein non-immunogenic or vice versa. So um, my guess is living long enough won't guarantee to protect you against every common cold. <laughs> but that's a good experiment. If you live to 130, you can do that test. <laughs> yeah. I'm wondering how you get from the X-ray picture across to the bizarro helix in certain direction goes. We get across the helix. So that is um, a Fourier transform. It's a um, basically 
there is a, um, there's mathematics that gets you from one space into the other. And um, I guess to the uh, Fourier transforms we see in other um, instances. So when you um, encode music on a CD, right, it, we listen to music in the time domain, but it's actually encoded on the CD in the frequency domain. Um, and so there, there's the same information, but it's represented in different ways. And so we know quite quite well how to get back and forth using Fourier transforms. The mathematics are a little bit complicated, but if you're somebody like Francis Crick, you can look at this pattern and basically know exactly, oh, two strands of helix running in opposite directions, um, and, and the pitch of the helix is 34, and the spacing of the basis is 3.4, and then you can start to model build. So there's a lot of information contained in the diffraction pattern. So how do you get into the field of interpreting um, uh, interpreting uh, things that you can't see. So um, that's a hard question. <laughs> you go to art school, I guess. <laughs> um, right, so, so we actually, so these are, they're not um, entirely invented images. So they're um, artist representation of the data that we can see using our tricks of reciprocal space and so forth. But unfortunately, I, I dropped that demo of, of with our experiments in our lab, we can see where the electrons are in these proteins. We can see where the electrons are in these drugs that bind to the proteins. And um, there's no artistic interpretation required for those experiments. But then drawing beautiful images of how flu virus floats around and stuff, that does require you know, some knowledge of science and some knowledge of art, certainly. So I have a, here's a, here's a, um, Speaking of, knowledge, of science and art, here's a, a polypeptide structure, a protein structure that's etched into glass. And there's a, a, an artist who basically does just that, um, takes scientific knowledge and makes beautiful pieces of art out of it. And so I can give you her name if, if you're interested in that. Why does uh, washing your hands Reduce the chance of getting a cold or flu. Yeah, so. Is that a folklore? No, that, that is not folklore at all. You should all just run and wash your hands right now. So, <laughs> so these, the, the way these proteins are held together, again, are these, um, these hydrophobic amino acids that want to form gangs, they stick together. And soap can get in there and break these things up. So if you can get in there and break up these protein-protein interactions, the, the capsid of the virus falls apart, and the nucleic acid then can't. So you can actually break the virus life cycle simply by um, disrupting these protein-protein interfaces. And in particular, the flu virus does not last long at all if it's outside of a, a humid environment, like your nasal epithelial cells, for example. And so um, a very good way of breaking the breaking down the proteins that are on the surface of those virus particles is to simply um, add soap, which, which breaks up these protein-protein interactions. All right. I think we can continue questions afterwards, but let's thank Scott again. <laughs>